So we're going to go into our next panel, which is about protecting yourself. Our first panelist will be Rob Mooney, the Supervisory Protective Security Advisor for Region 3 of CISA. Then we're going to have Matt Crane, who is the Executive Director of the Colorado County Clerks Association. And then our very own Karen Brinson Bell from North Carolina. So I think we'll, we are starting with Rob today. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, again, Rob Mooney with DHS Protective Security Advisor assigned to uh, Virginia. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, of supporting elections uh, in Virginia since 2012 uh, and enjoyed a great partnership with with, uh, with elect in Virginia. Uh, um, so I appreciate all, all the partnership there and, and, a, and a lot of uh, uh, common interests, uh, you know, for, for security and promoting uh, resilience in elections and, and leveraging federal resources. So it's, it's been a pleasure to be a part of that. Uh, so, so, and I look forward to continuing that. Uh, so I was asked here to talk about uh, security for election uh, activities and, and, and security at offices, and particularly some of the resources av available to all of you uh, through that. Slide or not? Oh, there we go. Sorry, hopefully it stays there. Uh, so hopefully every one of you know your protective security advisor assigned to your state. Uh, if you don't, at the end of this presentation, my, my information will be there. And I would encourage you to shoot me an email uh, and I'll be happy to link you up with that with that uh, local protective security advisor. We have PSAs that cover all 50 states and territories that are out here to focus on security and resilience of elections as well as, as, as critical infrastructure at large. Um, so we're out here to, to, to focus on and deliver all of, all of CISA and DHS's voluntary and free resources. Two very important they're voluntary and free right? um i know a lot of uh a lot of we, you know sis spends a lot of time and energy focusing on uh the cyber aspect uh of securing elections and infrastructure well there in, in order to have uh good cyber security you must also have uh some elements of physical security as well uh so today i'm going to talk a little bit about some of the physical security aspects of that um we have a slogan in DHS, uh, hometown, it's, a, it's an initiative, Hometown Security in Initiative, uh, with, a, with a slogan to collect, connect, plan, train, report. And I'll talk about a few of, the, a few of those items. Um, but before I dive into, into the connect, plan, plan, train, report, I wanted, wanted to spend just a second on leadership. Okay? Uh, leadership is instrumental uh, in developing a, a culture of security, right? It starts at the top. Um, and, and some of the very key elements of, of success uh, is, is number one, putting somebody in charge of security, right? Uh, and then some of the things to consider about is, is when you put some in charge, have them uh, focus on things like security management, emergencies, uh, continuity, uh, as well as cyber, okay? Uh, the next part of that is uh, connect, right? Um, so the idea here is to connect with some of your local uh, state, local, federal partners, right? Some of these, this is going to differ depending on where you're, where you're at. Um, but the, the, the key here is the last place that you want to be exchanging business cards uh, is in the middle of a crisis. Okay, you should get to know these folks up front, whether it's at the federal level with FBI, local law enforcement, you know, Fusion Center, get tied into your, uh, your ISACs, uh, other, other working groups, uh, and, and also your neighboring facilities, right? Uh, get to know what, 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 what you could uh, exchange information uh, with your neighbors, uh, maybe possibly resources. Uh, it's, neighbors are a good source of, of uh, being able to work together, especially during a crisis. Uh, to include, if you are in large tenant buildings, right, where you have multi tenants and you need to, um, you know, understand what each you're going to do during during crisis, right. So working together is is very important. The next uh, the next element is after you've uh, connected, right, have a plan. Put a plan in writing, right? Putting it on paper is very important. People come and go and cycle through, but it's very important to have this, have these things written down so that they can be carried on uh, in, into, you know, replacements and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and share it with your staff, right? So some of the things you want to develop here, uh, as it says on the screen, put together a security plan, communications plan, business continuity plan, uh, an emergency action plan for relevant uh, emergencies. Okay. Uh, as well as your cyber plan. And the last thing you want to do is you want to train your plan, right? 
Uh, and this doesn't, you know, it, it, even if it's just sitting around the conference table, uh, talking about security, talking about emergency planning, right? This is where it, it starts. It goes back to that culture of security, starts at the top down and, and making that a, a general theme throughout your daily activities, or at least make it part of a reoccurring activity during, uh, you know, meetings and so on and, and walk through uh, uh, different incidents and, and how you would respond to uh, two different things. We've all heard this slogan, see something, say something. Uh, the key here, uh, you know, connect, plan, train, report, know who you're going to report suspicious activity to, right? It goes back to, uh, you know, having those relationships, know those contact, uh, contacts with your, your local fusion center, state and local fusion centers, know that lo local law enforcement. And as always, you can, you know, report to, to DHS or the FBI uh, 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 for, for ongoing issues. <clears throat> As we get into some uh, specifics here, uh, it's important to know. So my my colleagues across the country, we've been, we've been out doing vulnerability assessments uh, of of election infrastructure all over the country for the last several years, right? And so we've we've worked and we worked through the national labs and we put together a document that kind of highlights a summary of some of the things, the common trends we're seeing at election infrastructure sites. Um, and 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 and. You know what we're seeing is physical security doesn't have to be overcomplicated, um, you know, or incredibly expensive. It just needs to be a priority. Okay, uh, it, you know, it's and it needs to be layered through your your, your planning, your preparedness, uh, you know, and communications and so on and so forth. It should be just a regular part of your your activities. Um, so spe specifically here, I want to talk about access control. Uh, access control, I've been to a lot of election facilities and, elect, and access control is one of the key elements to this, right? You want, you want to do some, some basic good housekeeping here, things like in, in ensuring employees are wearing identification, uh, uh, badges, um, you know, making, making sure that, you know, go, we're, we're locking doors. We're not propping doors, uh, things like that. Um, you know, enforce those policies, make it a priority. So some of the things here, this, this slide's a little overwhelming as, as, as you look at some very complicated and, and uh, expensive things, right? Well, like, as I said, security doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. It just needs to be well thought out, right? And through a layered approach of planning and training, right? You can incorporate some good solid, solid facility or solid security in, into your you know, overall posture. Some things that I wanna, I wanna uh, to highlight here that we've, we've seen as common um, is, you know, when it comes to your individual workplaces, you know, situate, situate that workspace so that you're, you know, you, you're not having a back to the door, right? So you can see people approaching, uh, that you're not propping doors, exterior doors, so people can't come in, uh, you know, j just walk into your facilities. Um, use the locks that are in place, right? Uh, you know, making sure that those, those uh, you know, data closets and your server rooms and places like that, Make sure that those things are locked. You know, if if, if locking a door is is possible, then then you should do so. Another one is for uh, you know first floor uh, offices. Make sure those blinds are shut. Uh, there's no reason that individuals from outside your building can look in and see the the work going on in your space. Uh, and also, as as we get into uh, you know when we're not in daylight savings or when we are in daylight savings time, you know it gets dark very early. Right when your lights are on or inside your facility, you can see right in. You can see where people are located at within your your facility. It creates a vulner, vulnerability, and you're susceptible to you know people outside uh, knowing where you're at and what you're doing. Uh, another one uh, common trend is making sure that you're doing background checks on on volunteers, staff, vendors. Right, making sure that vendors and and, and so on that it's in their contract that they that uh, that those vendors are conducting those background checks. Make sure that you have a, the ability to do mass notifications, right? How in an emergency are you talking to all of your, your staff and volunteers within your facility, right? Whether it's through a loudspeaker throughout the building or whether it's a, you know, a couple buttons on your phone or a radio system, have the ability to, to communicate uh, with everybody in your facility. Um, where possible, right? Install things like intrusion detection systems for when you're not in the facility at nighttime where you know somebody has, has been in there. Uh, and also camera systems, camera systems can serve as, and they don't have to be expensive, but they can serve as both a deterrent, right? So if I, if, if you know, somebody wanting to cause harm or do things, we'll see that camera possibly turn around, but it's also there for, for evidence collection as well. Okay. 
And the one thing that I've that I've seen a lot in as it relates to election facilities is a lot of times there are camera systems installed, but the receptionist or somebody working at the front doesn't have the ability to to, to leverage that. So do th something simple like put a monitor where that reception can see, right, to identify that threat approaching the building, right, or things like that, so that that person could take action, whether that be to call nine one one, lock the door, do all those different things that we that we put into our security plan, right. So. Uh, through a layered of approach of planning, some 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 basic physical security things, uh, you know, you, you can have a well-rounded security and, and, and make it a, a central part of your your processes. Uh, so some of the things uh, I'd mentioned that the the resources the PSAs uh, can bring, we have a suite of tools. Uh, whether we're talking about a, a full-blown vulnerability assessment or what we call infrastructure survey on a large complex, say it's an election headquarters or a warehouse for storing uh, voting machines, we have some tools that we can bring to the table, uh, and that can, and and we could also do something as simple as as a walkthrough of your facility and just give you some advice uh, on something that you're having a challenge with. Uh, I can say with confidence that every registrar in the Commonwealth of Virginia knows that we're there as a free security service to them, right? And they can call on us anytime and we'll come out and drive out to wherever that they're at the Commonwealth and do a walk through their facility and give them uh, give them some feedback uh, so, so that they can, uh, you know, make improvements to their facility. Uh, the most common tool we use is called, the, it was mentioned in the previous session, is the SAFE tool, the, the security assessment on first entry. Uh, it's designed so that we can go spend a short period of time, an hour or two hours with a facility, uh, get to know that a little bit, understand the challenges that they're facing, and then within a, a couple of short days, give them a, a, a written report that they can take back uh, and leverage the, the, the findings in that report to uh, either get resources or, or uh, you know, document, document challenges that they're having. Um, so, it's, you know, the Safe Tools is a great resource. Uh, and the last thing here is my contact information, uh, my phone numbers on there, and my email. I would encourage you to give me a call, shoot me an email, particularly if you don't have uh, uh, access to your local PSA's information. Uh, we'll get get them in touch with you and, and come out and uh, facilitate these services for you. So, without uh, further ado, Amy, on to the next panelist, I believe. Looks great. Okay, thanks, Amy, and uh, thanks, Michelle, uh, for the invitation to be here today. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Matt Crane. I am the executive director of the Colorado County Clerks Association. Um, I have been an elections administrator in Colorado uh, for 22 years now, since uh, since 2000, which was an awesome time to break into elections. Um, I've worked at the state and county level here in Colorado, including serving five, uh, six years actually as the elected clerk and recorder in Arapahoe County um, since leaving office. Um, again, I'm the executive director of the association, and I also serve as an election security uh, consultant for um, CISA, uh, for Homeland Security. So I'm um, still very much involved in elections, both at the national and state level. So today I wanna talk a little bit about our experience in Colorado since 2020. As many of you know, we've um, we've been somewhat the center of the storm. I know there's there's been a few of those um, across the country, but Colorado certainly had our fair share of issues um, over the last year. So just a bit about our, our County Clerks Association. Um, we're a little over 50 years old. We just had our 50th uh, anniversary two years ago. We're a voluntary fee-based uh, fee organization. Uh, all 64 County Clerks are currently members of the association. Um, we have two full conferences each year, which is very important for us to bring our folks together and staff together to be able to talk about it, different issues and network and make sure we're taking everybody's temperature throughout the year. Um, we have an elected executive board of clerks, including four regional chairs. Um, we do have a, a other staff besides myself as the ED. We have a lobbyist um, and other staff support. We are very engaged at our state legislature. Um, our, our, our association has a strong legacy of a unified approach, which is very important. For the most part, our folks are able to put aside their uh, political differences and work on policies um, that will be best for everybody. Um, one thing I didn't put here, but I should have, we're also very fortunate that we have a very strong relationship, um, usually, uh, with our Secretary of State's office, um, especially with the uh, staff that's been there a long time. Uh, we're extremely lucky to have folks like Judd and Trevor um, that we can be able to work with, um, build trust with, uh, be friends with, and to be able to work on a lot of these issues together with. 
So let's talk, talk a little bit about Mesa County uh, and why Mesa County was the perfect storm um, for an insider threat and what happened there. Uh, it starts with um, the elected official there was a low information election official, is uh, a low information election official. Um, this person never truly studied the laws or processes or systems here in Colorado to understand the checks and balances um, to ensure integrity in the process. Um, was never able to understand how to answer the question, how can you demonstrate that a Kraken doesn't live in our voting system? Um, another important point, the state of Colorado, as many states do, has a certification program for election administrators. Uh, this person never went through the, uh, never finished the certification program. Um, poor management by this person and, and her political appointees led to high staff turnover. So the people that were there in office when she came into office uh, in 2018, um, they didn't last very long and she lost all of that long time subject matter expertise. Um, this person is extremely partisan and has publicly supported um, the craziest of the crazy conspiracy theories. Um, all of this made her a very easy target for grifters and bad actors. Um, during the symposium, the Lindell symposium, um, when, you know, the, the grifters and bad actors were up there talking and giving her praise and they said, well, well, you know, she's the only clerk in Colorado who would do this. And really it was, she was the only clerk in Colorado who didn't know better and was uh, an easy target for them to get to do this. The other part of this that makes this a really, uh, you know, made this a perfect storm is that we have some very well organized uh, and very well funded conspiracy groups here in Colorado. Um, so the Dominion MDM in large part started here. Um, these groups are very effective at spreading malinformation. So taking one, as you guys know, taking one shred of truth and creating a whole narrative, a whole lie based on that, uh, based on that one shred of truth. Um, these groups are incredibly effective. They have an amazing network throughout the state um, that is putting uh, pressure on election officials to break the law, to do things um, like what happened in Mesa County. The pressure is continuing um, s still now, and it's only get worse um, as we get through our caucus process, our county and state assemblies, and then, of course, leading up to the general election in November. Um, these folks have been so effective. One of the groups here, USEIP, which is the uh, United States Election Integrity Plan. Um, you know, that's a little ironic they choose that name. Um, their leadership is now running Lindell's Cause of America. Um, again, they are very effective. They're very effective at creating this network that places lots of stress on election officials. And as we'll talk about in a minute, um, they're placing a lot of pressure on uh, county commissioners as well, the people that control those purse strings for the counties. So once this happened, this happened last August when it became apparent um, what, what happened in Mesa County, what was our internal response uh, for the association? First, we knew we had to act very quickly um, to make sure that this was an isolated incident and that none of our other folks were either involved in this or being, you know, how, you know, how much were they being tempted to do it? How close were they to sticking, you know, to jumping in that, uh, into that deep end of the uh, pool like that? So we started immediate outreach to our counties especially in that area of the state. Over there where Mesa County is, it's on the western slope of Colorado. Um, there are a lot of patriot groups out there. There are a lot of groups um, uh, that um, are very active in pushing these crazy conspiracies. Um, we scheduled uh, more regular calls, uh, all member calls um, with our folks. We had to change the rules for our calls um, because um, it became apparent to us um, through different um, avenues that the clerk in Mesa County was sharing our Zoom call information uh, with these grifters and bad actors. And so they were in there taking notes and um, listening to our calls like that. So we changed our rules to make sure that um, everybody had to be on camera all the time. And there were very specific um, login information, um, credentialing information. We were, we were very, um, we were very um, specific um, and purposeful on these calls to discuss the situation that happened in Mesa very openly and very directly, discuss the laws that were likely broken. And we really wanted to make this personal for our folks, um, just in case somebody was flirting with the bad guys and not being uh, open and honest with us. This was not just a Mesa County issue. Um, this was an issue that was impacting all 64 counties across the state. And we made it very known that what happened was a selfish act that was likely to increase the threats and intimidation on clerks and election staff all across the state. And indeed, that's what ha that's what's happened. 
Um, our association, um, the way that our association is, is created, our structure really helped because as I mentioned before, we do have the regional chairs. We have four regions here in Colorado. And so we, uh, we've instructed our regional chairs to have more frequent one-on-one -on -one contact with uh, clerks in their regions. You know, on a member call with 64 county clerks, somebody may be a little bit afraid um, to step up and say something, but in those in those individual conversations with the regional chairs where there's a higher trust factor, um, we're able to get better information and share better information that way. Um, we, as an association, we've contracted uh, with an emergency uh, communication specialist to help us with both, uh, with both external and internal communications. Um, and then we've done a couple of other things, election security updates, and uh, we've started our own rumor control page on our website called Get the Facts. Um, so one of the things that we um, discovered, um, and we, we knew this before, and this is especially true, you know, to steal a phrase from, from our CISA work, that last mile, that group of medium and small size counties. So our large counties like Denver or Arapaho or Jefferson County, well, they have large dedicated election staff that can spend a lot of time. Um, studying missing disinfo and have communication teams to be able to push this out. As you all know, the medium and small size counties, they have a lot more to do than just elections work. They have to do motor vehicle work, liquor licensing, uh, recording uh, in Colorado, marijuana licensing. Um, so there's a lot of other work that these clerks have to do besides just elections and they don't have the resources to dedicate to be able to go and chase down all of the latest crazy rumors and conspiracy theories. So one of the things I started um, was this election security update where we would send, we send out weekly um, updates on what are the latest crazy things that are being saying? What are the facts around that? Why is it malinformation or complete disinformation? And just starting to help inform and educate our folks about all the latest crazy things going on. It also allows us with the information sharing that we have to be able to document in these emails to say, hey, you know, this person we're starting to see in the eastern part of the state, a pickup in um, form emails from USEIP or another group FEC. Um, and so this is what that email looks like. These are the point, the talking points to it. This is how to push back on it, call BS on it, so on and so forth. So that's something that's been very effective um, uh, and appreciated by our members. Next, again, get the facts. This is our version of rumor control. Um, I have this actually in the uh, in our internal section. We'll talk a little bit in just a second about what we're doing externally. Um, get the facts plays an important role, obviously, externally for people to come and know what's true and what's not. But again, our folks, especially those medium and small size counties who have so much on their plates, they need a place that they can go. Um, to be able to get answers to questions like this. So that's, that's what's informed what's on our get the facts page, largely questions, um, clarifications, uh, requests for clarifications that we're getting from our election officials, um, you know, to be able to give them information to push back on. And then, of course, it's good for media and the public to come in and check on these uh, to check these facts too. So what did we do externally? Um, it was very important that policymakers and the public hear from us right after uh, the security breach and the ethics breach in, in Mesa County happened. Um, and it was important, the exec board and I felt it was really important to take a strong position. So we came out of the gate and actively supported the Colorado Department of State investigations um, into these uh, insider threat situations. We also made it a point to meet with our county commissioner association to discuss what was happening in Mesa County and some of the rumors about other areas uh, of the state and to really dive into the MDM that helps lead to these situations. Um, one of the things that we found out from these groups is, you know, we've been able to set up a pretty good firewall. Uh, where a clerk and recorders are pushing back or just not engaging with these people. So they're starting to go around clerk and recorders and go to the county commissioners who, contr who control the purse strings in the counties. And so what we've seen these grifters and bad actors do um, is go to the county commissioners and encourage them not to fund annual licensing agreements with our voting system uh, partners or with our other election technology partners as well. So we are, you know, we're fighting this fight on many fronts now, this MDM fight on many fronts to be able to, um, to do this. But again, these groups are well organized and it seems like we'll set up a good firewall here, we'll get the next firewall set up and then there's another one that we have to go, uh, go and, and, and set up. Um, it's a never ending battle with these folks. They're very persistent as you guys know. 
Um, it was important, so not just from a communication standpoint, but we wanted to uh, we wanted to make a strong stand um, and show up support for things that we felt were important based on what happened in Mesa County. So. Um, one of the things we've done is push for legislation and we're partnering uh, with uh, with the secretary's office and, and the general assembly. We wanted to push for stronger penalties for insider threats for for clerks who are election officials um, who violate uh, the law and their oath um, in the manner that what happened in Mesa County. Um, we are, we're also pushing. So right now in Colorado, um, the rule is that an election official has to be certified state certified within two years. Um, as an association, we push, we are pushing to make that um, so that a state, uh, a, a county election official has to be certified before they run their first major election. And if they are not certified, they will not be allowed to serve as a designated election official uh, in that capacity until uh, until they receive that certification. So we want people to know that we are policing our own and demanding better standards for ourselves. I, that was very important for us. The other thing that we've been working on too, um, and this work actually started before it came out, what happened in Mesa County. Um, but as we were pushing back on MDM, one of the things that we hear from uh, the grifters and bad actors um, is that, well, you can just, you know, if you ask the county clerks, they're just gonna tell you everything's fine here, uh, just move along, there's no need to worry. Um, and while we're very proud of our model, our election model here in Colorado, there are things that we wanna do that we think can improve the transparency of our election process and build confidence in our election process as well. And so we really came out uh, publicly um, with a strong effort on, on four major things um, that we think can improve uh, transparency and public confidence. One is making our ballot images and cast vote records available for public inspection at no cost. Um, we wanted to create a stronger signature verification audit process to make sure that all counties were doing it the same way. Um, and that the data, um, you know, if you wanted to go and find out the results in Arapahoe County and in La Plata County down south, you know, it was done the same way and the data sets will be the same. So it's something that you can measure accurate data points against each other. Uh, we wanted we want to push for voter list maintenance, uh, stronger voter list maintenance reviews uh, and audits. Um, this, the state does uh, some good work on this now, but we want to build that out and make it more uh, transparent. And then, of course, as as all of us know, elections are not properly funded at the state and county level, and so we're we're trying to push back on that. But again, we felt it was really important um, that that our constituents know. Um, that while we, we do think our, our model is good and they can trust the process, we're always seeking improvement. We're always seeking more transparency, better data collection, um, and better, better evidence that our elections are, 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 are well run. One of the other things that we're going to do um, is we're working on building a safety roadmap for election officials. And this is in large part, um, you know, a continuation of what you heard Jeff and Kim talk about in the last presentation. Um, you know, the Mesa County situation created a much more dangerous environment for clerks who are facing uh, more threats and, uh, and, and intimidation than ever before, um, you know, that Mesa County uh, situation happened. Um, as, as we all know, the laws aren't always clear about what behavior constitutes a crime. So where does free speech end and a threat begin or intimidation begin? Um, Election officials have questions, you know, and I've heard this on other national calls as well. I know this is an issue in other states. Election officials aren't sure who to call in what situations. And if you live in a part of the state here in Colorado, we have some of this here where the election official doesn't necessarily trust local law enforcement who has expressed sympathy for or actively supported uh, the conspiracy theories and the groups that are pushing this. So what do we do in those situations? Who can we call? Who can we trust in those situations? Also, lots of questions about, you know, once you make a call to somebody, what happens after that? Uh, how do you know that your, uh, that your call is taken seriously? How is that data tracked? I mean, I can tell you um, back in August, you know, um, I, got a, uh, I, I had a death threat come my way um, and I called, you know, I had just been in to speak to the local police, so I sent the death threat to them. Uh, ironically enough, uh, I got pulled over about a week after that for making an, Ill an illegal turn. Um, the cop is small world. I, you know, the town I live in isn't that big. Um, the cop that pulled me over was the guy who took my complaint. Um, so I asked him at that point, I said, hey, you know, what did, did you chase down the threat I got? He's like, no. Uh -uh. 
Um, so we, we all know that's not good enough. I know there's many stories like that um, across the states. So we want to be able to demo, you know, to be able to uh, get more visibility on what happens with those calls and more accountability for when those things come in. So what we're working to do here, we've met with our DA's association. We've met with our attorney general. Um, I've had great conversa uh, conversations with our uh, FBI election crime coordinator, um, of course, uh, with CISA. Um, and with our with our state partners, with the Secretary of State, we want to create a working group that answers these questions and creates the safety roadmap uh, for our election officials. Um, and so that's that's something that our folks are very, um, you know, excited is the wrong word. I think relieved, um, especially as they get more and more of these, um, you know, uh, crazy calls and the intimidation that comes in. So. Um, you know, again, I know we'll have time for questions in just a little bit here um, after the next presentation, but here's my contact information. Thank you again um, for uh, the opportunity to speak today um, and, you know, just excited to be here. So thanks again. Thank you for first, let me say to for uh, selecting me to be part of the executive committee of this organization. It is an extreme honor, and I am very honored to be representing the South region and some incredible folks who serve as state election directors in that region. So thank you. Um, and thank you for asking me to present today. Um, I certainly um, have been have not been subjected to the same things that many of you have, um, but have come close, I guess, is why this uh, hit home with me and is something that our agency has tried to be as proactive as we possibly can. Um, so I'll try to share with you today what's been shared with me and some steps that we've taken, uh, particularly in the area of doxing. For some of you, you hear the term, but you may not have really focused in on what doxing actually is. Um, we've had a lot of situations where we've had uh, threats communicated to us. We've had situations, I know it was very alarming for me when our Secretary of Health and Human Services had protesters at her home, um, but none of that uh, are actual doxing situations. Uh, a few of us have been subjected to this, and one of our colleagues was subjected to this back uh, last year, and it came to my attention, and because um, it, it was possible that there might be replicated efforts. Uh, when this came to my attention, uh, we really had not um, addressed doxing to the level that I knew we should have. Um, and so I was fortunate to be able to uh, gather together our partners, many that Matt mentioned and Rob mentioned. Um, you know, our, we, we spoke with our National Guard Cybersecurity Group, our CISO, our state DIT came together, our Fusion Center, um, our Election Crimes Coordinator. They were all part of a call to help not just me, but others on the staff here at the North Carolina State Board of Elections prepare for the possibility that we could be the next uh, subject of a doxing attempt. That particular doxing attempt, I've recreated on the screen because I don't want to further um, subject one of our colleagues. Uh, so this is this is an actual uh, text I've redacted and changed the name to protect the innocent. Um, so in reality, this is the, the doxing attempt. There was a broadcast through social media that said, weekend dig time, who is, and it named that state election official. It's time to shed some light on the players behind, and it named the state elections. What is this person's job? What is their background? What was their role in the 2020 elections? Why did they threaten to engage law enforcement and social media against citizens asking questions about the state election? Dig up everything. And then they provided a link to this individual's contact information on the state election office website. Um, and then, of course, they were inundated um, with messaging and so messages, emails, and so forth. So doxing by definition, is the act of compiling and publishing another individual's personal identifying information online for the purposes of harassment, intimidation, uh, humiliation, any number of things. Um, but it, uh, it it's very exposing. And none of us are immune to it, but it does seem to go along with when there's a increased media attention, 
then that also increases the likelihood of doxing attempts. Um, and, you know, all of us have faced increased media attention, some more than others, but it means that we're exposed uh, and that exposure just continues to go up. So what can you do? Um, there's a, an acronym that um, some of our advisors taught me. It's called TOPS. So the first is threat. Identify who are the threat actors that you should be most concerned about. Um, I don't have to personally or individually do this. Obviously, those working in our cybersecurity units in the state are monitoring that and helping me to be aware. Um, but the identifying the threat is the first step. Recognizing what opportunities those threat actors have to get your information is the O in TOPS. How could they gain access? What information is out there? Think about what is already a public record to them. Um, obviously, we I think in nearly every state, there's some degree of voter information, tax record information, um, there's other sources that may be readily available that create opportunity for a doxing attempt. But then think about what are the preventative measures that you can take? And it becomes really key to think about those preventative measures now, because once the doxing attempt happens, they've already started gathering your information and you're not gonna be able to pull it back. So I'll go into more detail about some of those preventative measures in a moment. And then think about what are your strengths? Where are you strong in protecting your information? Perhaps it's the way your contact information is displayed on your uh, agency's website. Perhaps it's the partnerships that you've developed and the tracking that they're already doing on the dark web or other sources uh, for information. Um, and how can you reduce those risks? That's the other strength. Think about the ways you can mitigate this situation in advance. So some of the proven measures have been touched on today in other sessions that we've set through. These are things that we know, and many of us have taken modules uh, on cybersecurity with this. We hear this, but sometimes we don't actually do what we're taught to do. So these are the things we need to be doing for doxing reasons and for other cyber reasons, obviously. Update the security settings. I actually sent out an email message this morning I sent out one yesterday. We're all very aware, aware of the significance right now, but really always of doing software updates, device updates, making sure our security settings are strong, working with our partners or internally, if you have the, you know, that within your own agency to make sure of the firewall settings and things of that nature. Use those strong, complex passwords. The doxing attackers will try to access your uh, personal email. They'll try to access other um, accounts that you may have to try to find more information about you. Change your privacy settings. This is not only in your work environment, but your personal environment. Think about the access that someone might be able to gain into your bank accounts, social media accounts, things of that nature. Don't provide personal information. Be mindful of this. Um, think about if you do have social media accounts, what are you displaying? Um, it's you know a really tried but true um, approach is when you go on vacation, don't tell the burglars that you're away from home. Post those vacation pictures when you're back from that trip. Um, think about personal information too in terms of your birth date. You might not give the year, but it doesn't take much for most people to figure out if they know the month and the day, it's not that hard for them to start trying different years if they have a, a general idea of when you were born. Uh, same thing, high school um, or college, be careful how much you reveal of that. We often are asked to put that in our bios. There's nothing wrong with it, but just be mindful of what that may lead to, what that path is. Um, and then, you know, we, we work hard to use VPN, and that's a, obviously a good practice, but avoid those public Wi-Fi's. When you're in a hotel, that's not the time to connect just because it's free. <laughs> Probably not even the time to connect just because if you have to pay a fee, um, because that's not necessarily a protected uh, internet access. 
uh, we provide in our agency when we're traveling or when we um, need a MiFi device so that we're more secure. Um, and then, of course, we all know to be looking for the spam and the malware and the phishing attempts and, and all of that in our emails. Um, but that's obviously there's an attempt there to reach out and try to gain personal information that could be disclosed about you. And then also, um, you know, certain information should never be shared, certainly not through email or text or something of that nature. Um, so, for example, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, just be really mindful of how you're giving out that information and how it might be able to be hacked or compromised um, by someone who wants to uh, dox you. So, this is the part that Amy, I think, knew why she knew to reach out to me. I just went over the proven measures. Those are things that we can do across the board. But when I learned of the situation back in the fall, our advisors uh, gave me some homework to do for some additional steps. And those are the ones that I want to focus on now. I, when I came into the position of state election director, I did remove myself from social media. It was, in, in most cases, it was a very hard decision. I miss seeing my nieces and my nephews pictures of them playing sports or school plays or things like that. But we've worked out other ways within my family for those things to be shared with me. It's been hard to have regained connections with people that I haven't seen since I was in high school, but now had those connections again and was you know, able to see their children and, and their loved ones that I had not seen for decades. Um, that social media in a good way um, served a very good purpose. But, you know, we also know that there's very bad things out there that we are out of our control. And so I chose to remove myself from most social media platforms. Um, and think about, too, the connections that you have if you are on social media platforms. So I do continue to have a LinkedIn account. But in, in realizing this situation, it made me very mindful of why did I connect to that person on LinkedIn? Was it because five of you in this group today were connected and that made me assume that it was a safe connection? What if Judd in Colorado accepted it because I had accepted it and I accepted it because Rob in Rhode Island had accepted it? This is the kind of assumptions that we may make and all along we may all be being fooled. So let's be mindful of the connections that we agree to accept and make. Um, again, don't overshare. Think about what you're posting before you put that information in there. If you're posting photos, what's revealed in the background of that photo? Uh, those are things to be mindful of. If you can, consider um, alternative names. Uh, I, I have a friend who's fortunate, I guess, that her name is Nadia. And when she had a social media um, profile, when she established it, she reversed her name to Aiden because that's Nadia spelled backwards. I don't have that good fortune, but some people do. It may also be a time that if you're on social media simply for personal reasons and your family nickname for you has always been Bud or Jack or something of that nature, then maybe that's the way you present yourself. I have an aunt, her given name has nothing to do with Polly, but it's the family nickname for her. So if she just creates a profile that's Polly, the family's gonna know that that's her and be able to connect with her. But the general public and her former coworkers and so forth, if she was concerned about that, would not be able to. I've already mentioned scrutinizing the connections. I think that's pretty clear. And then recognize, as I mentioned before, we're not immune. So the best thing that we really can do is lower our risks. So think before you post. And you know, remember that deleting does not delete everywhere. So when you do post something, you know, that's why we have to be even more mindful. Um, and there may be difficulties if you post in one arena and someone reshares it, you may not have the ability within those platforms to remove that information. Um, and then, yeah, this is a really hard thing, but follow the family tree. What are family members posting that actually reveal about you? It's hard. Many of us are not elected and not that the elected officials should be treated this way either, but you know, we signed up to be public servants, no matter whether we're elected or not. And yet, um, 
and maybe our family didn't really think about that when they supported us coming into these roles, but our families have to be mindful too. My husband's removed from many of his connections. He's started limiting over the years, his posts on social media. Um, and, you know, I, I think back just to the holidays and my stepmother asked me, is it okay if I post these pictures um, on my Facebook page? And I said, that's fine, but I did look over them so I could be mindful of what might be in the background. Um, it wasn't me being vain in how I looked. It was really just making sure that we weren't being exposed not just me, but members of my family. Um, routinely do a search for your name and all your phone numbers um, in the search engines. Uh, actually, I did this last night because I hadn't done it in a while and I wanted to be prepared to share that with you today. And there was one that came up. It may be just coincidence that the numbers of my direct phone line at the office happened to be on a foreign website, but I've already sent that over um, to our security partner to say, is this anything or is this something? Um, so that's that's another routine thing to do. And that's also, I can share, share that that's done by our cybersecurity partners. Um, on my behalf and others in the agencies, our board members, for example, um, these are routine things that they do, but it's a good practice to do, um, especially with your personal accounts. And then last but not least, um, something that's very particular to me, but we all need to be mindful of, um, I had the pleasure of conducting a home search um, in this lovely real estate market, and it took my husband and me about seven months to find a home um, and have our offer accepted in this very competitive market um, that the Research Triangle of North Carolina has proven to be. Um, but that once that was over, we realized how exposed um, that process made us. Um, and the potential for someone to dox, or as I mentioned, for someone um, to be aware of my home, much like they had been with our Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state. And so what you see in these not so pretty images are what we have done to try to um, just lower our risk with uh, Google is the first shot. Um, that is a blurred image of my home. It, required us to make submissions um, for nearly 40 different angles of our house to have our house completely blurred uh, from the Google search of our address. This included going through and looking at our neighbors, looking at various street views, um, and not just putting in our address, but putting in the address of our neighbors as well and making those requests to blur the portion that showed any part of our home. The lower one is actually from Bing, and believe it or not, I think my husband said that by the time we finished, there were over 100 requests that we had to make with Bing in order to remove all the images um, or, or portions of an image of our home. So you can see um, it, they're handled two very different ways, um, but this was you know, quite an undertaking. Um, thankfully, my husband helped with this, but we feel more secure. There's less, you know, someone can still locate my home address. They can still drive up to my house, but they are not gonna be able to take very good preparatory steps of knowing the layout of my lot, the layout of my house, the layout of my driveway, any of those kinds of things without physically coming and scoping out my property. Um, and at least they can't do that through a Google or Bing search at this point. Similarly, because we bought a home that had been on the market, um, we have made efforts to work with the um, listing sites, and there are so many. Again, this is one of those times where deleting may not delete. Um, we've had a lot of the photos removed. Uh, our particular home did not have a virtual tour or anything like that. But think about that. If a home that you've bought still has uh, access to a virtual tour, you've just given someone access into your home to walk through, know the floor plan, know the entry points and so forth. So that's why we took the measures that we did um, to try to protect ourselves better and to try to reduce um, a doxing risk uh, in this environment that we all work in now. So with that, um, please feel free to reach out to me if I can be of help. Um, I did not give you my direct phone number, but there is my, my direct email that is publicly known. So um, thank you, Amy, and I'll turn it back over to you. Karen and um, all of our presenters, that was 
both disheartening but uh, very helpful. Um, I want to go uh, to any NASA members who have any questions. So you can raise your hand, you can write it in the chat, um, or you can uh, just unmute and uh, ask away. I have one. <laughs> I have one very quickly for Matt. Um, you mentioned that you um, met with the County Commissioners Association to sort of, you know, build that relationship um, and help them understand what was going on. What was the reception like, and how has that relationship played out? Um, it's it's on the whole been very positive. Quite frankly, it was relief because. You know, they're not election subject matter experts and, you know, a lot of them come from, you know, obviously a part of a partisan point of view. And so they had questions too. So just to be able to go and allow, you know, make our presentation, talk to them about some of the overarching MDM that's out there and then allowing them to ask us questions um, and encouraging them to go in and meet with their clerk and recorders and, you know, take the tour and, and you know, let them walk, let the clerks walk them through the system and processes. Um, that's been a huge help. Great, thank you. Um, I see Mark Walashin has his hand raised. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. A uh, question for Karen um, in regards to the, the steps that you take. Um, I, I've noticed that we've got a, a handful of vacancies that we're working to fill. And, and as part of those interview processes, something I've been doing that I hadn't done before is being very upfront and honest. Not that I haven't been upfront and honest with people before, but I get to the point in the interview where I'm like, by the way, like you need to hear this, that, that one, I have a moral obligation to tell you that we've received threats. The boss has, the staff has, you may be involved in that as well. Um, I, I kind of go into a little more detail on that, um, to, not to scare them off, but uh, again, to make sure that they're well aware of the possibility before we get in, you know, any further into the election cycle. Um, with, with the steps that you take, did you develop any uh, you know, products or like a, a handout that you give to new staff members or, or um, is this something that, that your whole team has been made aware of and does the same thing or, or only certain members that, that maybe feel so inclined? Uh, anything like that? When we were on sort of high alert back in the fall, we focused in on those of us, the board members, myself, our PIO, our general counsel, some, and a few others who have been in um, high profile media, that sort of thing, um, because that's where we knew the immediate threat were was was at the time. Um, but for all of our staff, we've had um, a series of uh, cybersecurity modules. Uh, state government has required that, but we've also done some further steps ourselves. Um, we've had the uh, CISA crew come and do their uh, workshops as part of our every other week training that we do statewide for counties. So we've there's a whole series of efforts that I think we've made. Um, we've not just focused in on doxing, but it is something that we try to make everyone aware of. There are some uh, policies about um, what people can do and not do out on social media um, within our agency and state government. So um, some of that plays in as well. Okay, thank you. I see Rob has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks Amy. Uh, and great panel guys, that was, that was awesome. My question is for Karen. When you were working with Bing and and others, um, were you upfront that you were an elections official, and that's why you were requesting? I, I just I know that in some other areas, um, people are reluctant to hide information or protect information. And since elections is kind of new to the space of having to have our information be hidden, I didn't know if they had any pushback or if you were just upfront that you were an elected official, elections official. No, it's a service that anyone can do. Um, actually, in working through my presentation, I realized that one of our other neighbors has similarly done it, and I don't think they realized that we had done it. Um, and I didn't do it. Uh, my husband just kept used the link that they provide. Um, sometimes you have to. Uh, there's one of them, and I can't recall that you have to dig a little bit more um, to to make it happen. And I will say, um, I think it's Google in particular that once you blur, it's it's really difficult to undo. Um, so, if there's any reason that you're going to be putting your home on the market or anything, you might pause about it, but this wasn't anything that we did as an election official um, capacity. It is simply something that's out there actually for any member of the public. Um, I know Courtney Kanapka, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. 
Yep, um, this is Courtney from New York State Board of Elections, Care Election Center. Um, I just wanted to comment about the, um, the free Wi-Fi. So basically, I also wanted to just state that you shouldn't, even if you think you have a VPN tunnel, your first initial connection through that free Wi-Fi is not going to be encrypted. So the say you connected to that, that free Wi-Fi, it could be a rogue device. So you're typing in your username and your password. Now that person who's on the other end, basically capturing your data, has your username and password to get into your, v, your VPN. So that information could be stolen and you could be redirected to a malicious site that maybe looks like your real VPN. So I just wanted to also state, you know, probably use a, a, a MiFi device or secure Wi-Fi. Even if you go through a VPN, at first, your first initial connection is not encrypted. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, uh, if, if anybody has it. Oh, I have one. Um, so my question is for Matt. Um, I guess I'm just, I mean, your organization sounds amazing. Um, you know, we have, our clerks have like an organization that's definitely not as organized. Um, and I guess I was wondering, like, did they, did the remainder of the clerks react well? Are there any concerns that people will now not be members moving forward on this? Um, or have there been, has there been push up or is it pushback or is it more of, has it been more of a united front? By and large, it's been a united front. We've been worried quite honestly about um, a couple of clerks um, uh, otherwise who, um, you know, we are, there's another one that's being investigated here now that uh, that appears to have crossed some lines. Um, you know, we suspect that there are some who are um, sympathetic uh, to the Mesa County clerk's position, but, you know, they're scared to, you know, break the law and do those types of things. And that's where, you know, that's where our constant calls to people and, and checking in with them to, you know, reinforce what's true, what's not. Um, we have worried a little bit about, um, you know, people leaving the association, but, you know, we we also know we have to stand up for what's right. Um, and I'll tell you a, a bigger concern about current members leaving the association. And I know, you know, you guys are seeing this in your states as well. You know, we have some candidates, you know, most of our folks are on the ballot this year. We have some people that are just nutty that are running for, uh, for uh, clerk and recorder offices. And so we're keeping a close eye on that. And, you know, that worries us a little bit about, uh, you know, some counties dropping out of the association, but there's not a lot we can do about that in advance. And hopefully when we get them in, we have a pretty good training program for new clerks. Um, so hopefully once they get in and start to see everything they thought they knew is uh, pretty much wrong, hopefully that brings them into the fold. But it, that's a big concern for us moving forward. Thanks. Michelle, if you want to close us out. Absolutely. Uh, I want to thank my uh, the panelists. I mean, I think this was a great panel. We got great information, um, kind of wide ranging, but all of it great and useful. Um, I'm fascinated by all of this.